In November 2016, I led a first year political science tutorial at the University of Toronto. Since we were discussing the social construction of identities, I thought I'd get the students to consider whether all identities are socially constructed, and if not, where we draw the line. I told them about a video of a tall white man in his 30s who asked students at a different university how they'd react to him if he said that he identified first as a woman, then as black, then as short, then as Chinese, and finally as five years old. I could tell that my students were curious about why it seemed easier to accept the idea that gender is socially constructed, a matter of free choice, than it did to think the same thing about age and the other characteristics. No one was quite willing to see the man as a short, black, five-year-old Chinese girl. But even though I knew the topic was interesting, and that the students were interested in it, and even though I'd gone out of my way to set it up for them so that they'd be eager to discuss it, nobody was saying anything. I asked why to help understand what I had done wrong in setting up the topic so that at least I could do it differently in the next tutorial. One student raised her hand and said I'd done fine. The issue wasn't me. The student said that she was silent because she was worried to share her opinion for fear of being singled out or accidentally saying something offensive. I then asked who else is not speaking for that reason. And for the first time in many years of experience as a teaching assistant in the classroom, something happened that most teachers dream about. Everyone raised their hands. No one was talking because everyone was afraid. I encouraged them to speak despite their worries and asked how I might make it easier for them to do that. Someone suggested it would be easier if they were assigned an opinion so that they wouldn't have to be responsible for holding it or feel bad for defending it. The students were eager to talk. They wanted to talk, but they were afraid of even letting themselves think out loud about a position that might land them in trouble through social sanctions and accusations that they're racists, fascists, bigots, or sexists. Political science students at a top Canadian university had become accustomed to having their mouths shut it's only a matter of time before the mind shuts too. From time to time, moments of ideological persecution on campus make their way into the news. How many such moments are unnoticed, unreported, and unresolved? How many professors have been successful in sabotaging the careers and reputations of students who crossed an invisible red line into the domain of forbidden discourses, illicit beliefs, and dangerous ideas? and were therefore called enemies of some kind? How many students learned early on to stay quiet and conformingly repressed their nascent intellectual curiosity? But what good will it do anyone if the university becomes a place of intellectual repression rather than intellectual inquiry? If minds are made to tremble and fear rather than labor in the search for wisdom? How does a society fundamentally dedicated to the dignity of the mind banish certain inquiries to the realm of the inadmissible when those inquiries are but themselves expressions of the dignity of the mind? Today's political landscape is rent by division over what is to count as rational and politically acceptable. The divisions are growing, the wounds deepening. If we do not recover a common sense of rationality and inquiry that pays homage to human dignity and decency, if we do not protect the inquiring minds of today's students and tomorrow's leaders from overzealous ideological reprogramming, if we cannot properly detect, map, analyze, and possibly erase, reposition, or redraw the invisible red lines that govern the limits of rational discourse, to make more room for respectful disagreement and to tone down the tendency to see every disagreement as an impassive enmity, there is little reason to expect the deepest causes of our political self-destruction to abate. Somewhere within itself, in departments of psychology, philosophy, and political science, for instance, 
The university must be a place where students are encouraged to think without the fear of reprisal and without ideological tests. A student eager to study intellectual currents in leftist political thought should not be mocked and scorned by professors for whom the left is anathema. The same goes for the right. Neither should leftist or conservative professors distort the study of the classical liberal or any other tradition. You can't have the ideological sniping get in the way of the genuine inquiry. Educators must not neglect to foster the spark of independent thought that animates and elevates the mind. Our next generation of students and leaders cannot fear to acknowledge on a university campus of all places that a tall white man in his 30s is not a short black five-year-old Chinese woman or girl. Those who subject their students to ideological tests chastising them for following their natural intellectual curiosity, scaring them into submission, should consider the old saying about nature and the pitchfork. The respectful and dignified treatment of intellectual curiosity, the fair-minded willingness to withstand, perhaps even to provoke disagreement, the prudent understanding of the moderate educator, all that is preferable to the frightened silence and ideological conformity of our young 